This is a road trip from North Louisiana to South Louisiana. An essay called Panorama by Gypsy Damaris Boston. From the pine-covered red clay hills of North Louisiana to the moss-draped live oaks of the black and coffee grounds land of South Louisiana, I watch nature's pageant of beauty and look at our state with pride and delight. Pasture after pasture of cattle, black, red, white, and mixed, pecan groves, some recently planted with the square protective fences still around the small trees. Young cotton with freshly painted wire wagons waiting at the gin for a good crop. Tall corn and thigh-high okra in gardens. Pretty homes with crepe myrtles blooming in the yards. One very large field is yellow with bitter weeds. The owner was never a country child who had to drink milk after the cow had eaten bitter weed. Although there are no cows in this field, I think about the seeds that will wash into the other fields and I wish the owner would mow. The rains that caused so much trouble made everything lush and green. The water hyacinths are beautiful. Near Alexandria, we hike across a cow pasture, climb a levee, and look down at the water of the river. Muddy and red like its name, its mud flats smooth and unwalked on. Each little layer, like a tiny step, marks the water's slow withdrawal. Uprooted cottonwoods and debris on the banks show the force of the recent flood. Way down below us, seven turtles are swimming near the shore. In the central part of the state, soybean fields are still under water. The huge pumps a man had brought in to try to keep his field dry before the spillway was opened are not running. We drive past sections of wild looking swamp woods where so many deer died. In the drying areas, people stand close together, either crawfishing or catching fish trapped in pools left from the receding flood waters. We cross the Mississippi on a ferry. The Mississippi's fast-moving gray-green water still covers the willows near its bank. Recently painted ships, too far away for me to read the names, stand at anchor watching their turn to be loaded from the grain elevators or the barges pushed by sturdy tugboats. The river barges look like flat cars at water level. The seagoing barges are as tall as a string of red box cars so that ocean waves will not wash across the deck. Here the people had watched the Mississippi with concern because a change in the river current could have eaten away at the batcher. If that protected bit of land had gone, the levee would have crumbled and the force of the escaping water would have washed away towns. Young boys tell of filling sandbags to protect the levee. When the water would wash the sand out of the bags, bags of shells were used to slow the water and the sandbags were placed behind them. An additional problem developed when the continuing south winds pushed the tides inland on the bayous and would not permit rainwater to drain anywhere. By the shell roads, turtles line the logs, three or four more in groups, some with backs covered with the same yellow-green plant that spreads like a rug over the drainage dishes. These sunning turtles may someday be a thing of the past, as the armadillos have moved into this part of the country. When the turtles come up on land and lay their eggs, the armadillos dig them up and add eggs to the diet of grubs that they find as they root in the ground. We drive down the bayou in one of the small towns. Here had been the old business section of town because for years the people traveled this water road. Two Lafitte skiffs are racing. These are made here and perhaps are not found any other place. They use automobile motors. I look at one and can see the outline of a narrow board under the paint. Most boats are being made of fiberglass or plywood now. The front sits high on the water. A narrow rectangular box on the front stores the catch. The side is low to throw out the trawl or net. The back fans out 
to give a place to sort the catch. This is a working boat. I look at the small piro hewn out of a solid cypress log, and I'm surprised to see it painted, even though the paint is very faded, because the piro must be very old. It is shallow, slightly pointed at the end, and the smooth walls look no thicker than a breadboard. There is a trick to paddling a piro. This boat is a vanishing part of a French culture. Near the coast, flocks of egrets, white and as large as frying chickens, feed on insects, cattle stir up as they graze. These newcomers to Louisiana have now reached the cattle pastures north of Shreveport. Here, people are picking figs while those at home are not yet ripe. I walk in the yards. The ground is so rich and it rains so much, everything grows. My outstretched arms go halfway around one of the oak trees. Oranges are as large as a fist. Banana trees grow, but do not usually produce good fruit. Most of the trees are dated by hurricanes, not years. Since the last bad hurricane, a tallow tree seed sprouted by a young orange tree. The faster growing tallow tree grew completely around the trunk of the orange tree, covering it for about a foot from the ground. Now the trunk of the orange tree is about like a drink bottle, and the tallow tree, towering 15 feet above, has a trunk as large as a gallon bucket. I wonder if perhaps by now they share a common root system. I eat seafood gumbo cooked as the French do and served with French bread. The loaf weighs only eight ounces, but it is over 30 inches long, as long as my arm. The gumbo is delicious and spicy, and I recognize many things in it. Shrimp, okra, smoked sausage, crab. But I don't know how to eat the whole crab in its shell, served in my bowl of gumbo and rice. I watch those crabs go into the pot, gray-black. But they are brick red now. Everywhere I see people who are hard-working, happy, and who love their homes and families. I think America is full of these people. You are listening to Confetti Park, a podcast brought to you by confettipark.com.